So if we were to answer that question, so that's our lower right-hand corner, which set of products is expected of the reaction shown? So we've got all of those reagents set up, and we'd have to go through and predict what would happen. Okay, so number one, what would be the most reactive thing that you should identify? So you look at that reaction in the box. What's the most reactive thing there? What was that? The acid. The acid. Okay. So what should the acid do? Act like an acid. Good answer. Acids react with bases. What makes a base? Don't tell me it reacts with an acid. Lone pairs. So ideally, you would recognize that our oxygen there has lone pairs, and we would end up protonating that oxygen. Right. Now we'd have to evaluate what else do we have in our reaction. Well, we've gotten rid of our hydrogen. Whoops, that erased a lot more differently than I thought it would. And we'd be left with bromide. We still have a whole bunch of HBr because it says excess. Fine. When we go through and evaluate that now, what's the most reactive thing? What's that? Positive charge on the oxygen. So we want to stabilize that by that oxygen taking electrons. It can either take the electrons from the bond on the left, or it can take the electrons from the bond on the right. Okay. If it takes electrons from the bond on the left, we would end up with carbocation, right? Is that carbocation particularly stable? No, in fact, it is horribly unstable, and it does not ever form. If it went from the bond on the right, we would still end up with a primary carbocation, also not particularly likely to form. But, as I believe your hand gesturing is suggesting, we could go through and have the bromide come in and do a backside attack. Okay, so in one case, backside attacks. We never form the carbocation, and we've got our bromine. Or it could attempt to backside attack in the other structure. Would it backside attack in the blue circumstances? Why not? Sterically hindered. We've got a lot of electron density behind that uh, carbon-oxygen uh, bond. So we don't expect that attack to occur. Okay. It's not really tertiary. It's an sp2 carbon. Okay. And that's really why I picked this example. So that attack can't happen. We really only get the substitution occurring on one side of our structure, which then leaves us with answer B is our correct answer, okay, which I know I kind of cut off. Okay. We wouldn't be able to do A because A requires that we do the substitution in blue, which we said we can't do. B or C also requires that substitution. Okay. So when we're looking at our standard substitution reactions, Okay, either SN1 or SN2, we cannot react uh, with sp2 carbons. doesn't happen. Okay. Which brings us to this idea of coupling. Oh, and I just realized that that picture is going to get in the way. Let's see if I can get rid of it. Hey, that got rid of it. Good. Um, the coupling reaction is that we take any two species, okay, and in particular two carbon pieces, and we link them to each other. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon because what we'd be doing is one of those carbons theoretically would act as a nucleophile, the other one would act as an electrophile. Okay. It is different from our standard nucleophile-electrophile chemistry because in the coupling mechanism it is mediated by a metal. A metal facilitates the transfer of electrons or connecting of electrons between these two species, which means we never really have a carbon nucleophile. Okay. So if we go through and take a look at our species in this system here, what we're trying to address is what would our possible product be. Okay. Well, this is where it can become tricky, and one of the reasons why this is actually a neat reaction is that those R groups 
can be sp2 hybridized carbons. I can take a benzene and I can hook it up to another benzene. Okay, which is kind of a bizarre phenomenon. How could we possibly do that? Because what we are effectively doing is a substitution. Okay. But we can't do a direct substitution. It must be mediated by something. That is the important role of the palladium catalyst. So it is typically a platinum or palladium catalyst, but it can really be a variety of different metals. Okay. So all that we're really saying is that we can now connect those two pieces. This might seem odd. Well, how did we do that? Okay. And this is a trickier thing to evaluate. If we take a look at the carbon and the structure that I'm now making blue, what charge would that carbon be? What would X most likely represent? Halogen, so that carbon is most likely positively charged. In our red structure, what charge is that carbon? Why negative? <laughs> so fair enough, looking at the answer, we could suggest that maybe that one is negative. We need to come up with another reason for that, because that assumes you know the answer. Why being connected to boron be important? What are you suggesting? So boron, typically in this situation, would act as an electrophile. It would accept electrons, because it only has three bonds, so it has that empty p orbital. But that doesn't explain why the carbon should act as a negative, which is what you were suggesting, okay? because it was connected to boron. You're suggesting the boron should act as a positive. We don't really have a strong reason yet why boron would act as a positive. Why might boron be more positive than the carbon? It's less electronegative. Boron is less electronegative than carbon. Okay. So we are generating a negative charge on that carbon. Unfortunately, that is a very, very small partial negative charge. Okay. So to help facilitate this along, this is where our intermediates or our reagents in the middle here are really going to come in handy. Number one, you have to go through and use a base with most of these. What is that? And this is where it's a little bit weird. The base, I'm just going to pick T-butyl, okay, is supplying a negative charge. What can that negative charge do? could accept protons, and since it's saying base, we might expect something like that. Except, unfortunately, their reference of a base, this is coming from Wikipedia and general organic chemists uh, as a whole, does not apply to strictly Bronsted-Lowry bases. When most people reference base and acids, they actually expand that definition to really apply to Lewis acids and bases. Okay. There's nothing acidic in here to pull up a hydrogen from. So we can't be referring to it as a Bronsted-Lowry base. So we're referring to it as an electron donor. Where's our electron acceptor? Positive carbon is a possibility, but then you're doing the substitution that we said you can't do. The boron. If it attaches to the boron, now what happens? What charge does the boron now become? Try again. Ah, oh, you monkey! <sighs> ah, I did it again! Stop it! <laughs> Our boron would become negatively charged. Does boron want to be negative? No, so it is drastically trying to dump one of those groups outwards. One of the groups it can dump outwards would be that R and really make that carbon a strong negative charge. Okay. We're in an environment that can't stabilize that negative charge very well, okay. so we need something to help collect those electrons temporarily. The thing that helps mediate and collects those electrons would be our metal catalyst. 
So the metal catalyst ends up grabbing each of the individual pieces, brings them all together, and then facilitates the bond formation between each of those pieces, much the same way that we would expect with our hydrogenation reactions when we added hydrogen to, say, a platinum metal. Um, this is very commonly referred to as a Suzuki coupling. It's one of the big common references. Uh, Suzuki won a Nobel Prize along with a couple other people, which it's a good thing I'm recording because I forgot all their names. But super common reaction. In fact, my old research group used it all the time. Right? And to pass one guy's exam, they insisted that he draw a mechanism for the Suzuki coupling reaction. Okay. Um, you're starting with the platinum or palladium catalyst. That coordinates to your metal halogen. Okay, so your metal halogen coordinates to the, to the metal catalyst. It inserts itself between those bonds. Okay. And then what can happen is your base can coordinate as well, kick out the halogen. Notice that we end up generating, whoops, that really active boron species. The metal catalyst can also help grab and pull that together so that we end up trapping the two R groups around the metal. The metal then says peace, cuts itself out of the reaction, and we end up with our final coupling of those two pieces. Okay. Yes, this may seem exceedingly complicated, but ultimately what's happening? We take carbon number one, carbon number two, and what do we do with them? You put them together. Do we do any rearrangements or motions? Nope, you just put the two pieces together, okay? Coupling, just attach. Okay, that's all we're really looking at. One of the important aspects is to realize where you are attaching. Okay, so now I want to go back. If I'd gone through and picked R groups, say for the first one, let's just do, that's an N. And for the other one, Let's just do something like this. Okay. What would our product be? How many of you think there should be an aromatic ring? Okay. Good answer. Yes, we should keep the aromatic ring. Should we do anything to the nitro? No. So let's just draw our nitro on there. And pair to that, I have the alkene. Okay. Not ortho or not meta. That's not happening. Okay. Not our ortho position. Neither of those are going on. Why are those things not happening? Why am I only getting that direct opposite? It has to do with where your reactive carbons are located, where there are reactive carbons in your starting materials. Whoops. Where the boron's connected and where the halogen's connected. Those are your reactive positions. React those in your coupling. Okay? If for some reason if you move into hardcore synthesis, you end up seeing a lot more coupling reactions. Okay, metals are becoming increasingly more important because they do help facilitate the connection and extension of your carbon chains without having to generate incredibly reactive carbon nucleophiles. Because an incredibly reactive carbon nucleophile can often react somewhere else in your structure and destroy it. Okay, so your coupling reactions are super important for that reason. This might be a relevant topic, say, for the next Five days. Six days. Questions? Can you go back to that ACS? Oh, can I go back to the ACS question? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No, I cannot. Not easily. Here. But I can take a picture of it. We're going to have a lot of these kind of silly pauses as I go through and do this. Done. Okay. 
So the reason I addressed or used this as our example is that that carbon we might predict to have some reactivity because what's connected to it? Oxygen. That electronegative oxygen. We just, unfortunately, within the confines of this type of reaction, a standard substitution, I can't get that position to react. Okay, it is too sterically hindered. What is nice about the couplings is the coupling drops the metal in between that. Once the metal has now inserted itself, now we don't have to worry about sterics. The metal can facilitate the new bond formation. Okay. Other questions? On that example, you don't have a carbon. Yeah. And we aren't doing two carbons, unfortunately, either. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple big hints that you're looking at a coupling reaction. Number one says coupling. Number two, I think you actually said it. Boron. You're looking at a boron carbon connection. Okay, that is not a very standard connection. If you see boron with hydrogen, you're doing your standard addition reactions, um, adding hydrogen and OH across a double bond. But boron to carbon is kind of a big tip off. Very, very rare that we've seen that. And I f think that's the only case we've seen it is within the confines of the coupling reaction. Okay. The other thing you should be looking for is that gets you your potentially negative carbon. What do we also need? Our positive carbon. So our other reagent will be an alkyl halide. Okay. Other questions? So I now have 50 slides that I'm somehow supposed to cover in now 55 minutes. Uh, somehow or another, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I was not able to get easy pictures of everything, but what I did try and go through and do is take a review slide and then found a couple questions that I could potentially put up on it in reference to this silly kind of slow process. I would commit to memory everything on this slide okay, as far as nomenclature. Super important to be able to go through and name each of your compounds. Um, just happened to notice that we're missing the acid naming. Our acid naming is ic acid, sometimes oic acid. Your esters, let's just do that in a different color, are O8. Um, and then, unfortunately, the amides didn't make it to that list, but the uh, amides are named as amides. Okay? Questions about anything up on that slide? The amides, no, are going to be up closer to your acids and esters, and esters, and unfortunately, I can't remember their exact priority, but they're up in that situation. If I had to guess, they're under acids. But above esters? That's a good question. I'm not sure on that one. The only cases I've seen amides show up for strict nomenclature is they are explicitly asking an amide structure. There aren't any other functional groups there. Do, um, does alphabetical order take precedence over number? Or is it Alphabetical order will mostly take precedence over number when referencing certain structures. So if you're looking at a cyclic structure, there's a order in which you should be naming the substituents. That order is organized by IUPAC, and there's no obvious reason behind why you would number things in that fashion, okay, particularly if you end up with equivalent numberings. Whenever you go through to number your substituents, in all cases, you want the lowest number of substituents. Other quick questions? Okay. I'm going to do this a little bit cleaner this time. So I'll cover my finger over that. And ding. Oh, come on. So if we were going to go through and name this, you guys want to spend a 
Minute and a half? That's a lie. It's not a question. Do it. Spend a minute and a half. Come up with the answer. You guys are good nomenclature anyway. I agree with that statement. It's Anilin. Anilin is a common name, not IUPAC. There are some common names that overlap that you're responsible for. Most of the benzene substitu substitutions you're kind of responsible for. Anilin, toluene, phenol, those are the three big ones. Um, trying to think. I can think of a few others, but I don't think you're responsible for those. But aniline, toluene, and phenol are for sure things you should watch for. Toluene is a CH3. Yeah. So there's a benzene with a CH3. That is toluene. That is phenol. And that is aniline. Yeah. Are P and O parent or whatever? P and O are strictly the relationship of any two groups. Okay. Just like cis and trans. So officially that is not IUPAC because it's not specific to everything happening within the structure. It only refers to those two groups. So um, the O, M, and P references are strictly not IUPAC. Questions on nomenclature. Okay, what did I have as my next little slide? Oh, I had Lewis structures as the next little slide. Um, when it comes to nomenclature, and I don't think I pulled a question for this, you do have to remember your Kahn Ingold prelog rules. Uh, and I changed my mind, there is a question on this a little bit later in here. Um, you have to be able to assign priorities to each of your individual groups. Okay, so you have to be careful when you go through and assign. In a standard structure, once you've assigned your priorities, the lowest priority must be aimed away from you, and then you assign R and S. Okay. Where this becomes a little bit trickier, there's my question, question seven, is if we take a look at this example. Whoops, that was not what I wanted. This would be question seven from our stereoisomerism section. And done. Since I really wanted to address the Kahn Ingold prelog, we'll address that comment first. So we'd have to find our stereo center. So this is where having multiple colors can come in handy. We've got two stereo centers, which I'll label as red and blue. We have to assign priorities by looking at the atoms immediately connected. So if I go out, I'm looking at oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, and carbon. Can I assign any priorities immediately for the red one? Oxygen is going to be number one because it has the highest atomic, is it number or mass? It's mass. Okay. What else could I assign? I can assign the hydrogen as four. Assigning one and two then becomes a problem because we'd go out and it's carbon versus carbon. There's no difference at that atom, so what do you do? Move to the next atom. And when we go to the next atom, I'd be going out to an oxygen versus an oxygen. So we'd always go out to our highest priority atom. There is no difference there, so we backtrack and we check again. Okay. For our bottom one, we'd be going out to carbon. For the top one, we'd be going out to oxygen. Okay, we have to double count the pi bonds. Okay, it's a tricky one. That means the top one is our highest priority. Our bottom one is our lowest priority. We could then go through and assign one to, whoops, connect our arrows. No, I did that right. One to two, two to three, and look at the direction we're turning. In that case, we are turning counterclockwise. According to our Kahn Ingold prelog rules, that means we would be assigning S. Okay. Don't do any fist bumping quite yet. Okay. Fisher projections are by definition established where the atoms to the side, that is a wedge, are wedged coming at you, and the atoms 
on the y-axis, if you will, are dashed going away. This means that our lowest priority of our hydrogen was actually aimed towards you. It needed to be aimed away. You were looking at it from the wrong direction when you assign priorities by saying it going counterclockwise, which means instead of it being assigned S, it is actually R. Okay. Questions about the one in red? Okay, let's take a look at blue. Go through and look at blue, same deal. I'd assign one. I'd go out carbon versus carbon, no difference. I go out to an oxygen, go out to an oxygen, go out to a carbon, and I would go out to hydrogen. And that means the top one is my higher priority. Bottom one is number three. There's my four. My connection, one, two, three. That is going which direction? Mm -hmm. Counterclockwise, which would suggest S. S. But again, Fisher projection, I'm looking at it from the wrong perspective. I need to change it to R. Your answer is RR, which is A. Okay, so there's all the work that I would go through and write down on it. It's nice when I have a nice little eraser and I can just erase the digital screen. In all actuality, I would have drawn over the top of everything, and it would have looked like an awful mess, and I could very well have gotten confused within it. With tracing paper, you just shift the tracing paper, which I forgot to bring today. Okay. Questions about that? Advantage of the Fisher projections. I'm not positive on this, mainly because I don't like Fisher projections, so any clues on Fisher projections I've kind of just ignored. Where are the OHs? They are on the right hand side of the structure. What was the chirality of those carbons? R. Why identify the OHs? The OHs were your highest priority atom. So the highest priority atom will be located on the right hand side for a R chiral atom in a Fisher projection. Okay. What if it was on the left hand side? Then it would be S. Okay. Yeah, I know. L versus S, left versus right. Why has it become S? S stands for sinister, which has its roots all the way back to Cain and Abel, because Cain was left handed. Sinister, death killer person. That's about as far as my Bible knowledge goes, so you probably know more. Other questions? Uh, we don't have to worry about the up or down situations for assigning R and S. The way the chirality is determined is you're looking at that left-right axis. It's one of the things that's nice within the Fisher projections. Okay. Other questions about it? How I went through and did it wasn't really all that long. I mean, that processing, some of it was written out, but you could probably get that done in about a minute, minute and a half. Yes, you have to go fast, but you should be able to do that in about that time. I'll time the next one when we go through and look at it. Questions on it? Okay. Why? I'm positive there's another slide. Where's my slide? Did I skip a slide? I deleted a slide somehow. What the heck? Sorry, if you're watching at home, I guess you're dizzy now. Okay, so I definitely left a slide out, and I want to make sure it's important and we address it. Um, so we may just jump straight to a question on it. Uh, you need to be familiar with drawing Lewis structures. Okay, so you need to understand all of your rules within Lewis structures. Probably the most relevant rule for you to remember would be deciding what is a best Lewis structure. And your best Lewis structure rules are coming from
What makes a good Lewis structure? So we're looking at a full octet. What's another reason or another good thing to look for? Minimize charge, which is going to address the next big issue. In minimizing charge, what do you have to be able to do? You need to be able to assign formal charge. Formal charge is equal to valence electrons minus the number of bonds minus I don't like the reference of pair. That gets ambiguous. I would say number of non-bonding electrons. As soon as you say pair, people start counting the pairs, and you can say, oh, there's two pairs, which is four electrons. It messes with the counting. Okay. So again, I'll go ahead and pause it. Approach, first thing I would go through and do is check for octets, and that would eliminate immediately answer A. That oxygen only has six electrons around it. We started timing? Yeah, 31, 19. Um, the rest of them in my quick check through, uh, I see eight, 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 full octets all the way through, eight, 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 and eight, eight, eight. Okay. So I can't do anything with octet. The next part is minimizing charge. So I'd have to calculate my formal charge for each of these. To go through and do the formal charge, I take my valence electrons, which is five for nitrogen minus the number of bonds, there's two bonds, minus the number of non-bonding electrons, four. This is where the pairs comes in, it becomes a problem. We said minus the number of, of non-bonding pairs. A lot of people will say five minus two minus two. It needs to be minus four. It's the number of non-bonding electrons, okay? Which gets me a charge of negative one. My central nitrogen, Five minus, we said bonds, four minus zero gets me positive one. My oxygen, neutral, six minus two minus four gets me zero and neutral. So some of you are shouting out answers right away as to what these charges were. I would guess at this point the reason why you were able to do that was because you've started to memorize the common bonding patterns for these. So what you might do is if you recognize a common bonding pattern, identify that charge right away, and if you've got time, go back and check it later. So in this case, I have a negative nitrogen and a positive nitrogen, overall neutral structure. If I move to the bottom case, I've got a nitrogen with, I know that's hard to see, a triple bond there, which means that oxygen will come out with a positive the central nitrogen is, already we should be screaming bad because you've got a positive next to a positive. The last nitrogen you should notice will come out as a negative two. Five minus one minus six equals negative two. So that already is a worse option than B. If we move to the last one, Again, we have that triple bond. We've got 5 minus 3 minus 2, which gets me neutral. That nitrogen in the middle still has four bonds all the way through in all of these cases. And that last oxygen is negative. So I'm now comparing C to B. Which one's the better answer? C puts the negative charge on the more electronegative element. That is my better answer. Wow, that was three minutes but I talked through it. Give me some credit. Okay? So recognizing bonding patterns can get you through it faster, but if they throw an element that you haven't seen at you before, you'll have to go through and calculate your formal charges. Okay? Questions on that? Okay. Um... Oh, that is the stupid Lewis slide right there. 
I totally thought that was something else. So there's the information that supports the question we just did. I thought that was a different slide. So the big important point there would be that formal charge. Okay. The interpretation afterwards on what makes a good Lewis structure didn't make it onto this slide. Watch out for implied hydrogens. Never, ever, ever imply charge. Okay. Uh, different representations. So clearly this is a copy and paste issue because I copied and pasted it. Um, from other slides where they were animated. We'll go back there. We've got a lot of different representations for structures. You are expected to be able to convert between them very, very quickly. You've got the line angle drawings followed by the Newman projections. Upper right corner we have the chair. Underneath that This is really a Newman, but it's a Newman of our um, chairs. And then the last one is a, a Hayworth, which I think is spelled with the Y. Okay, so you're responsible for being able to look at these, interpret these all fairly quickly and easily. Um, the line angle, you're used to seeing everything's drawn like that, so I won't refresh your memory on any of that. Within our Newman projections, what is, are those two structures the same? No. no. So because they're different, we refer to them by different names. The top one is Clips. The bottom one, Staggered. Okay. Staggered, depending on how complex our structure gets, can subdivide into two separate categories, hence the brackets. And we end up with the upper one being are gauche, and the bottom one, anti, anti, whatever you want to call it. Okay. I did put them in order of energy. The anti is the lowest energy, followed by the gauche, followed by the eclipsed. Okay. The eclipsed being the highest energy means it is a, at a peak on an energy diagram. Okay. We can't go up any higher to anything else, so it is the peak of an energy diagram. The gauche and anti are valleys within your energy diagram. When we look at our chair drawings, we'll notice that there's two possible ways that, or two positions that we could locate our hydrogens, one being equatorial and one being axial. Our axial are straight up and down, okay, kind of parallel-ish with your paper, I guess, the length of your paper. The equatorial are perpendicular to the length of your paper. Okay. Uh, the important aspect there is that, and this is why I drew the Newman projection, your axial are higher in energy because what relationship do we have with the rest of the chair? Give me a little more than that. It's not just closer, it's gauche. If we took a look at our eclipsed, what's the relationship between it and the chair? It's anti. Okay. Or not eclipsed. Equatorial. Our equatorial position is anti to the, the rest of the chair, which makes it lower in energy. So when we're trying to draw the best chair, we want our large groups placed into the equatorial positions. One thing to be careful on, if you were being asked what is the correct drawing for trans 1,2-dimethyl cyclohexane, that does not mean automatically drop them into the equatorial position. Yes, that would be the lowest possible structure for a dimethyl cyclohexane. But is that the trans product? Okay. So you have to go through and deal with your nomenclature and your understanding of where to place the substituents. Make sense? Okay. I know there's a question like that in the book, but I didn't go through and find one for that because my computer is slowly dying as far as battery power goes. Are there questions on that? Okay. Uh, last thing I'll mention will be our Hayworth. Okay. They do tend to be kind of happy to use the Hayworth projections because it's a little bit easier to interpret your cis-trans relationships. 
if you, what you end up doing is envisioning your rings as a flat planar structure. If it's drawn up, then that atom is above the plane of the ring. If it's drawn down, it's below the plane of the ring. So it allows you to see that cis-trans relationship a little bit quicker and easier. You may not be explicitly asked a question about Hayworth, but they will use it to show the relative stereochemistry. Okay. So our Fisher projections. They are useful primarily in biochemistry, which is why they kind of show up on the ACS exam, is because they're trying to convince in organic instructors to set students up for biochem, okay. which kind of do and I kind of don't all at the same time. Um, the reason why we want our Fisher projections is that when you move to biochem and you look at your sugars or your carbohydrates, there are a ton of different stereocenters on those molecules. So what we want to do is come up with some math method that we can identify those stereocenters quickly and easily without having to go through and do a whole bunch of extra work. Okay. So it allows us to process them a little bit easier. Okay. Unfortunately, in that processing, you rearrange your structure or rearrange the orientation on it so that your atoms that are not part of the carbon backbone are now by definition wedged at you. Okay. And the carbon backbone is always dashed away from you on that vertical axis. Okay. This means when you assign R and S, you're assigning them backwards. Okay. That's really all you need to get out of that. Um, in general, for it to be a proper Fisher projection, your highest priority atom needs to be at the top of the structure, or highest priority functional group, I should say, should be at the top. Its highest priority carbon should be at the top of your Fisher projection, and the lowest priority should be at the bottom. So when we go through and take a look at our structure, the aldehyde carbon has higher priority than the alcohol carbon, which means when we organize, it's put at the top of our Fisher projection. Some things to watch out for and be careful. If you took that structure and we flipped it over, okay, in a standard Fisher drawing, if I take this structure and flip it over, has the structure changed? Still the same thing, but now the relative locations of where the OHs are relative to each other appears to have changed. In one case, they're on the right-hand side. In one case, they're on the left-hand side. And since you're drawing just solid lines, it's, ten, it's easy to forget that you have changed your view on the molecule and that this structure is not the same. Two, three, four. As this one. If we are looking at a Fisher projection, these two structures are enantiomers of each other. This is not a simple just pick it up, turn it over, and flip it down. Okay? Because in a Fisher projection, everything on the horizontal axis is by definition wedged. If I pick up the structure that's nice and pretty looking with the solid black lines and pick that up and flip it over, all of those wedges become dashes. That does not superimpose on this. So it's one of the big things to watch out for is that you have that wedge dash stereochemistry specified or implied in the Fisher projection. You can't just pick it up and flip it over. That said, if my thumb is pointed towards you and I turn it this way, did I change its wedge and dashedness? No. So if we change in the plane of where the molecule is located, that is a fair game maneuver to do, and that does not change the wedge and dashness of it, if you will. If we rotate it in the other plane, that's where it becomes a problem. Okay. Uh, it also makes it slightly easier to see the relationship between molecules sometimes, depending on your perspective. If you are given a structure in a Fisher projection, I would try to do as much as you can in the Fisher projection before you start moving on to other things. Okay. Questions on that one? We already did the practice on that one, so I wasn't going to go back and do it again. Uh, stereoisomers. Shoot, do I have one on this? 
Uh, I don't think I have one on this. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, you are responsible still for identifying enantiomers, diastereomers, meso compounds, all of that fun stuff. Okay. More than likely, you will not be explicitly asked what is the relationship between these two structures. Okay. That's an OCHEM 1 question, first term. What you will be asked is here a reaction occurs. Now what's the relationship between the products generated out of this reaction? So you're being asked to do two things. Okay? It's a stacking ability. So you need to come up with some way to evaluate. When should you be concerned about enantiomers, diastereomers, or meso compounds? A couple big times that it becomes important. Okay? Look for a chiral atom. Do you have an atom in your product that you have now drawn because you're drawing everything that has four different things attached to it. If you have that, you need to go back and be very careful in answering your question. Okay. And this holds true whether or not the next big hint that you're looking at this. The next big hint is does the question give you as your answer choices an antiverse diastereomers meso? Okay. If it's not explicitly stating that, it may be embedded somehow in their structural answer. So anytime you identify an atom with four different atoms attached, you're going to have to be careful with it and approach that question a little bit more carefully because you probably have some stereochemistry hidden in it. Okay. Identifying enantiomers, if there's only one stereocenter, okay, you are probably looking at an enantiomer situation. Uh, the only way you wouldn't be looking at an antimer situation is if you can only generate that one product. Very, very rare for that to happen. Diastereomers, you have to have two chiral atoms, at least two. Meso compounds, you have to have at least two chiral atoms. So if you draw your product and you only have one chiral atom and you see diastereomer or meso, you can immediately eliminate those as answer choices because you have to have because it's in, they're not enantiomers, and in that reference you have to have two chiral atoms, otherwise they would better classify as one of the other branches. Okay. So if we go all the way through our flow chart to get down to our diastereomers, you have to have a chiral atom. Okay. If you don't have a chiral atom, you're in one of the other categories. Okay. So if you're yes, then it's evaluating something about mirror images. For it to be diastereomers, if you had two chiral atoms, one changes RS. So you might say, oh, enantiomers, the other chiral atom won't. And that is where it classifies as diastereomers because they aren't mirror images. Okay. So your diastereomers, and they can be broadened, but that is your general class. You will need to have at least two okay. because of that mirror image aspect. Okay. So this flow chart just kind of puts them all together. This is more appropriate for a first semester situation because it's just raw comparison of two structures. Okay. Second semester, you're probably looking at your product that you drew one of, and you're saying what is involved with it. If you have two chiral atoms, then you should start to worry about diastereomers or meso. If you only have one, you're looking at enantiomers more than likely. Hi. Questions? Um, you're a little bit less responsible for your physical forces, but you are still required to understand something about them. Your melting points and boiling points. The stronger your force, the higher the boiling point. Hi. How do you know you have a strong force? That ultimately comes from looking at the bonds within your structure. This also applies to solubility. Like dissolves like. Okay, if you have similar forces in one molecule and similar forces in the other, we would expect them to mix. Make sure you answer the question carefully and look for those knots, because sometimes you'll see a knot pop in on you. Okay? Questions? I'm trying to remember what. Oh, this would be a nice one to have a question on. And I don't think I pulled any questions on this one. Um, atomic versus 
molecular electrons is an important distinction to make. When we look at our atomic orbitals, our electrons are in sp or d orbital shells. When we look at hybridization, we now can move to s uh, or sp or sp2 or sp3. Okay, so we're blending atomic orbitals to make these molecular or potential molecular orbitals. Ultimately, in all cases, what you're going through and doing is coming up with some way to explain the bond angles that come out of it. So you end up with your hybridization theory, which just looks at the groups of electrons, or ultimately your electron shape, and says, what hybrid orbital do I have to generate? How can I make that? So for a tetrahedral shape with four groups of electrons, we need four atomic orbitals. It has to be all the S and all the Ps, sp3. If we go through and look at the mathematical orientation, this is typically referred to as linear combination of atomic orbitals. Anytime you bring two orbitals together, they now have multiple ways that they can interact. They can interact in a way where the orbitals overlap with each other, same phase, in which case, what happens? These are the nuclei. If we're in the same phase, we get an increase in electron density where between the atoms, which we better know as a bond. If they are out of phase with each other, now we get less electron density where those two orbitals would overlap, and that then pushes the electron density outside. And now there's no electron density between the atoms, which by definition is not a bond, also known as an antibond. Every time you bring an atomic orbital near another atomic orbital, you will generate a bonding interaction and an antibonding interaction. They are either in phase or out of phase. Every single time. Okay. This can also be tied back to our conservation of energy. If you start with two atomic orbitals, how many molecular orbitals do you need? Two. You start with five atomic orbitals, how many molecular orbitals do you need? Five. You cannot create or destroy matter. Orbitals are effectively matter. Okay. Hybridization summary, being able to recognize your hybridizations within those. We've already evaluated some of that. Okay. Um, this is probably the more relevant one to look at. If we take a look at the molecular orbital diagram for... Sorry, I didn't do that really fast. Was there a question back there? No? Okay. For what is effectively... R13-butadiene, okay. we would look at the orbitals involved in our bonding. We've got lots of sigma orbitals and uh, pi orbitals, or yeah, sigma bonds and pi bonds. Which ones should we be more concerned about? Why the pi? Higher energy, those are going to be the ones involved in our reactions. So when we're asked to look at the molecular orbital diagram for something with pi bonds, we should be looking at how the p orbitals, why the p orbitals? They're the orbitals that make pi bonds, how they interact with each other. So we would go through and say, well, there's an atom with a p orbital. There's one, there's one, there's one. There's four atomic p orbitals. You may have seen me real quickly draw these things out before, just to give you an idea. Now that I've got all four there, I want to look at all the possible ways that those orbitals could combine and interact with each other. They can interact where they all have the same phase, which means lowest energy. I'm getting a bonding interaction. The electrons can jump all the way across. Okay. I've got it drawn in a slightly different format, but the same idea. As you go up in energy, what ends up happening? You increase the nodes, which are the locations where you can't have electrons interact because they are out of phase with each other. Okay. And I thought this was cool when Gina pointed it out before, so I'll point it out again. Deciding whether we have bonding or anti-bonding. Are those in phase with each other? Which means, how about the next two? The next two, what's the overall result? 
bonding. How about those two? The next two? Next two. Overall result? Bonding. Move up to the next one. It's getting crowded down there. Overall result? Anti. You should be able to see the same thing for the top one. Okay. So how do those orbitals overlap? Notice we started with four atomic orbitals. We ended up with four molecular orbitals. Okay. For every interaction, so for every orbital, I get a bonding orbital and anti-bonding. They pair evenly out of it. Okay. Didn't, yeah, I don't know why that slide's in there. That shouldn't be there. We've already saw that. Moving electrons. Remember, electrons are unstable, and they don't like confined spaces. Okay. So we need to somehow place them on atoms that can hold that charge better. The more place you can give them to roam, the better off they are. Okay. So bigger atoms hold negative charge better than smaller atoms. The other thing that contributes to this is the electronegativity, the ability for an atom to actually hold that charge. Okay. So when we're looking at where electrons move, you've got resonance and mechanisms, and ultimately your biggest concepts are just give them lots of space and place them someplace that can hold those electrons. Okay. When you're moving electrons around, you've got two ideas, mechanisms and resonance. Both of them are doing the same idea. When we're doing a resonance, you are finding your source of electrons, and you are moving them to a place that lacks electrons. There's only certain ways you can move them. Okay? Atom to bond or bond to atom. Okay? One extra one. What is the extra rule that you can do? You can go bond to bond. Do not go more than a single bond. Verify that your octets are satisfied. If you have to, okay, you can break a pi bond to shift electrons away okay, so that we have too many electrons. Okay, when drawing resonance structures, we don't care too much about having under an octet as long as we are under an octet on carbon. Carbon is the only one that you should ever draw with less than its octet. Oxygen and nitrogen should always have their octet. Why? They are the most electronegative elements. Okay? They need to have their octets. When we go through and look at mechanisms, you'll find your source, same deal as with resonance. You'll move the electrons towards your chosen atom, which is likely an atom that is missing electrons for one reason or another. Verify your octet is satisfied. If it's not satisfied, then you can start to break bonds. Break pi first, then sigma. Okay. Given a choice, what you're breaking is those electrons are then going to another atom, which means you are generating an atom that's holding extra electrons. What characteristics should apply to that atom? Before you look at electronegativity, should be large. Okay? Your halogens are good cases, and they should be electronegative. Um, all of our functional groups, I'm just going to skip through all that. Get to our acid bases. So this summarizes everything for reactions. Anybody recognize the picture? Yeah, it's from Lebanon. Yeah, greatest movie ever. Uh, free radical reactions are just off in their own little world, hence the little goblins. Okay. Um, so just kind of be aware of that. They don't fit very well in the Lewis definitions of acids and bases. So these are kind of your subcategories on how you can move out uh, between these. Um, so you've got your general reactions, which you can look over later. You've got your energetics. In this case, how many steps is this reaction? 
one step, and we know that because one transition state. Okay. How would you know you have an intermediate? You would have two transition states. Your transition states are your peaks. You now have an intermediate. Okay. Where's my definition? Our acids and bases, that's the one I really wanted to get to. I would highly encourage you to write down your definitions. When you get the test and I tell you to start, write down your definition of a Bronsted-Lowry acid, write down the definition of Bronsted-Lowry and base, and whenever you're asked about acids and base strengths, you go back and you look at that definition and apply it to the question. And the application of the question is ultimately coming in, where's my rule set, come on, here. We are always trying to minimize charge. So look at your reaction and evaluate what's happening within it. Your reaction wants to favor minimal charge. So push your reaction in a way that we have the least amount of charge possible. There are exceptions to all of these, but that's our ideal target. The next part, if we have charge, put the charge on the atom that is biggest. Next point. Put the charge on the atom that is the most electronegative, or put the negative charge on the atom that is most electronegative. Molecular effects. Okay. If we have no difference in the atom location of our charge, can we move that charge around to other atoms via resonance? That is, a, again, our size effect. We can then move to another molecular effect, which is the equivalent of our electronegativity. That is looking at our induction. Is there an electronegative element to pull electron density away? And then if you're really stuck with it, you can start to look at hybridization. And then the other big one, um, aromaticity. aromaticity. Okay, so if I can find my question here really quickly. Come on, Penn. minute. What's that? Well, work through it again. seconds. Fifteen seconds. association. I say nitro, you say? Try again. Not a bad one. Get you one, one more try. Say what? Okay, so there's our problem. Anytime you see an NO2, what do you immediately need to do? You should be drawing the Lewis structure. Why is that important? Because number one, you said NO2. That didn't really help us out. And number two, you said electrons. Is nitro a source of electrons? No, it is the complete opposite of a source of electrons. It is sucking electrons away. Okay. Why does that become important for us? What was our definition? Base. We are looking for the base, which means electron. an electron donor. So for it to donate electrons, it must have electrons. So I would go through real quickly and try and find the most basic atom in all of these which when you're asked for these kind of strongest situations, there's one thing in particular they're having you rank. Identify that commonality in all cases. In fact, I don't know why I drew in the H. We're looking at the amine. So that nitrogen. Strongest base means it is an electron donor, okay? which means it has to have electrons. Okay. Well, what does the nitro group do? It takes electrons. 
So what happens to the electrons on the nitro on the amine? They get sucked into the structure. If they get sucked into the structure, can't be an electron donor, which would suggest C is also going to be a bad option because, again, of that nitro group. We now run into an issue on looking for um, ranking between A and B on which one's the stronger base. Okay. If we go through our rules, charge doesn't really help us out. We can move to an atom effect size, so nitrogen, no size effect. We can move to electronegativity. It's same deal, same atom. We can move to resonance. Can I do resonance with either of these? B has resonance, which does what to the electrons on the nitrogen? Stabilizes them, brings them into the structure, which means not as good of a base. So the strongest base ends up being A. I'd avoid that. Um, that, I'm pretty sure, was not what I meant to do, but I did it anyway. Questions on acids and bases? Okay. As I can tell, you are all thoroughly excited. We are done, as far as time goes. Um, the rest of the slides, I mean, that was kind of impressive. I made it through roughly 30 slides. 